Hey everybody, welcome to the pre show hangout. Um, I am Eric Scott to be. This is Yang Yang Wang. We are two of the dungeon scrollers. Um, <clears throat> we're a team witch hut this week, which is kind of a, a smaller group, generally speaking. So, uh, Aaron's getting dinner and uh, Emily is dealing with her stuff. So, it's just the two of us, Yang Yang. What do you want to talk about? Hmm, I guess first I want to say hi to some of the people that are in the chat. It looks like nice. it's uh, we got Meyer Doug, we got Rumpus, we got Brian Cortijo, and we got Excellent. Cassius so far. Um, they're the people who've been speaking a little bit. And Brian asks, you are Eric, though. Right, Eric? I, I am, yes. You are the this is my... Eric. I am the Eric. Question. Have you ever met another Eric that's been taller than you? I think once I met another Eric who was taller than me. One time. It's actually time. happened. Mm -hmm. How much taller? Like one or two inches taller than me. It's now, very uncommon for someone to be taller than me. And if they are taller than me, it's rarely very much taller than me. So like as a tall person who's used to just like towering over, over everybody else, when you see another tall person, is there like some sort of tall person joke or greeting? Secret handshake? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Of course, I can't tell you it's a secret. Oh, I see. Just got to grow a foot and then. Yeah, then exactly. Down. Exactly. Or hey. just get yourself some elevator shoes and just pretend to be a tall person. <laughs> yeah, I'll go incognito. Oh, go undercover uh, for a little while. So, uh, Monk of Greyhawk just subscribed to tier one for seven months, currently on a seven month streak. Thank oh, you so nice. much. Appreciate it. Yeah, our game's not set in Greyhawk, but we do have affection for Greyhawk, so it's all good. Good choice. Man, Greyhawk is one of those settings that I do not know very much about. Like, I know it exists, but that's about it. Well, if anybody's on our Discord, you will see that the uh, image that I use is uh, kind of a Greyhawk thing, so... That's just my way of saying join our Discord. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, no, that's good. Good plug. Good plug. Uh, I feel like didn't I hear that Greyhawk was one of like the original settings? Like it's not uh, Mister Mistara. Okay. Okay. It's so like I can't. The... I I can't comment extremely intelligently on this because I'm a realms guy. But generally speaking, Greyhawk is a very old very classic iconic setting for for Dungeons and Dragons. I think when um, Guy Gax and Arneson started making D&D, they didn't necessarily have a, a fully fledged like, this is our setting and this is what it's called and this is all the rules of all the setting. They, they just started playing a bunch of games, right? And uh, eventually they collated all that into Greyhawk. That's, that's my understanding of it. And um, it's pretty cool. It's um, there was a time when the um, uh, when it was speculated that Greyhawk was going to be the official setting for fourth edition, but uh, oh really? It it wasn't necessarily to be. Like uh, we got the points of light setting, which is similar but not the same. It doesn't it doesn't have. The idea was that the points of light was going to be a kind of generic setting that you could kind of put into any world that you were running your game in. It was basically a valley with kind of interconnected uh, people in it, which could fit great into Greyhawk or into the Forgotten Realms or whatever you wanted. Um, yeah, it was called like Nenter Vale or something. Nenter Vale, exactly. I believe Greyhawk was the official D&D setting in second edition i'm not sure i'm not sure like when i started gaming seriously it was like the very early 90s so most of these decisions were made before i started gaming so um and it, might, it is possible that we didn't have an official setting labeled as the official setting of D&D until fifth edition and it was forgotten realms like, there's some argument that Greyhawk was the official setting of third edition, 
but I'm not sure that that was really determined. Maybe someone in the chat knows more about this. I know some of you are more Greyhound fans than I am. Then you, your knowledge surpasses mine, is what I'm saying. So. Um, yeah, so kind of hopping topics a little bit. Um, we did play that one shot on Monday, um, mm -hmm. the Stargazer's Guide to Aurora. You got a chance to play... Man, I just I could see like the visualization of the name, but I know it's not pronounced that way, and I know Ger it's not Goethe. Goethe, okay, Goethe. Yeah, you played yeah. Goethe. How do you enjoy it? Well, I don't often play small races, and Goethe was a no, right? Goethe was three foot seven, and um, that's three feet shorter than me, and uh, I I'm often accused. And I'm not saying that it's not true because it definitely is true of um, killing off short races because I don't sympathize with them because oh, they're I so see. short. Wow. It's not, no, no, it's not that I don't sympathize. It's just that. Oh yeah, we're um, we're doing a little thing with the music this week. Um, Yang Yang is mostly trusting me to adjust the various volumes, but I don't necessarily hear exactly how it sounds on the stream. So, because I'm not maintain. listening to the stream. I have never watched a stream where someone said, oh, the music's too quiet. So definitely yeah. turn it down. That's, I feel like, just blanket rule. Turn it down more. So I think how it's going to go is Yang Yang is going to find, like, what he thinks is a good baseline for how loud the music should be. And then I'm just going to vary it based on what happens in the game from there. So that's part of what should be established during this hangout, I think. So the baseline that I normally keep it at is actually like 40% for myself mm. on my side. Mm -hmm. So um, if somebody says it's loud on your side, whatever it was, like basically just cut it in half. Okay, let's see. So Bart I... is just like, just playing his heart out. <laughs> and we're just like, Quiet. Could you could you turn that down? Could you just and the part's like what yes. louder? Yeah. My music is great, but I really do hate when you go. I mean, it's been a long time since this was something that ex I experienced. But when you go somewhere, you go out somewhere to like visit with your friends, and then surprise, there's a live music act, and they do not appreciate you talking during their set. It's like no, no one told me you were here. I like Emily's mysterious goat sheet that she's hung in front of her camera. <laughs> she says she's going to do something a little different today. She's going to be playing, uh, she's going to sit on the ground or lay on the ground and play in her PAs, just like an old school D&D sleepover. Wait, really? Yeah. That's what she said. I, I missed I, it. We'll, we'll oh, see yeah. how that how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, it's up to you to like. I didn't know we were seat. doing floor PJ D and D. You guys can't tell me these things. I mean, Emily started the trend. Have participated. Up to you if you want to, you know, follow. We could set right. up for some other time. You guys are liking liking the music better. Doug says it it sounds better. Um. Yeah. I fully, Doug, I fully agree. Like, if you go somewhere knowing there will be live music, you should be paying attention. But the places where it's like they didn't announce it, like, you that's, show up and you're like, that's where I'm oh, like, oh, yay, there's <laughs> live music. This wasn't my plan for the evening. Now we're all in a bad sort. So this is really on the venues. Yeah, so I guess uh, anybody who was here and watched the one shot that was on Monday, what do you guys think of it? What do you guys think of the setting? Uh, how do you like Jake? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And then please tell us how much you loved our characters and our role play, because, you know, of course, we're the best. I thought it was pretty fun myself. Yeah, I had a good time. I uh, The music was kind of like popping off like crazy, but, you know, that was <laughs> that was me doing that. So DJ Eric. Yep. Yeah. No, I thought you had some I, I liked you had some really good musical moments and then you had like the um sad trombone and like the ba boom <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's like where the heck did you take those up? There was at least one Wilhelm scream, so Oh nice. You uh 
Y'all probably don't believe me, but <gasps> there it's it there. Is. It's there. <laughs> yeah. Was that your arrow shooting sound effect? Uh, the arrow shooting sound effect sound. Well, okay. So it depends on what the arrow hits. Okay. So if it's arrow into wood Ooh. and arrow into flesh. Oh. Arrow into flesh is a real gross sound effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to do it again. I can't hear either of these, and I'm perfectly happy with that. It's probably. Yeah, probably you're eating, so I think it's, it's fine. There's the general weapon impact. Um, swords clashing. Oh, nice. Sword swooshing, not clashing. And then the ever so popular. That's right. Sad trouble. Yeah. Um, at, at one point, uh, we had activated a column in the center room, which was like putting off magical radiation. And I found the lightning sound effect. And the thing about um, Sirenscape is that you can play multiple sound effects at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you can also find multiple versions of the same sound effect and play them about at the same time, slightly staggered. So that it's just this, like, it goes from like, to like this, this storm of lightning. I was at one point playing like four or five lightnings at the same time. It was yeah. neat. I had a good time. I was yeah. I I wasn't even drinking that night. Uh, maybe I should be. <laughs> so that's what was different. Yeah. Okay. No, that's me. Like, what's better, role playing, drunk Eric or sober? But they're both wonderful. Uh, I feel like drunk Eric is more mischievous. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's what that sounded like. That was only three electricities going. Ah. It was so many electricities. And I have a whole set of dragon roars. Ranked by color. Okay. Black dragon. That's the black dragon, right? Boom! How did I know? <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. Red dragon? It's green dragon. Oh. One for one. One out of two. Okay, okay. Gold dragon. <laughs> I only have the chromatic dragons. Oh, okay. I mean, this one sounded like a red dragon to me. That's the red dragon. Okay. Yeah. Does it sound like um, like Benedict Cumberbatch? Yeah, then it's the red dragon. <laughs> yeah. Here, let's let chat guess this next one. Okay, I'll play it for for uh, a bit. I'm not hearing one right now. This dragon is apparently cowardly. Is there any way you could raise the sound effect, like, by half? They're all at max. Oh, interesting. Well, let me see. Maybe I can, maybe this will do it. Oh, <laughs> the volume bar has turned orange. Possibly in warning. Okay. Let's try this again. Is that louder? It is louder. I don't know sure. Maybe if you just turn off the music. We'll just have just the sound effects. Fine. Okay, here we go. Okay, one last time. Yes, this dragon's color. Only the chromatic dragons. So, Doug says blue. Rumpus says white, because it sounds smaller. Any other guesses? Brian says black. <laughs> blue is dragon. Blue? 
It was blue? <laughs> All right, Doug got it. Good job, Doug. So, so far we've heard um, a blue, a black, and a red. Are there more? Yeah. Oh, that one's turned real low in volume for some muted. reason. <laughs> there we go. Well, that one's real different. Real different. Wait, wait, you got to give people a chance to guess before you reveal what it is? No, I don't. It's my stream. I can do what I want. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> That's a bone dragon? That's a a white dragon, buddy. A white dragon. White dragon. Yeah, it's fine. I think dead that's me. icing death. It oh, is. Ah, uh, yes, my, of course. And I have my black dragon here too. I have icing death up there. Mm -hmm. I love this one because he looks like you could just fit like a a bongo on the side of the mini. So that <laughs> he looks like he's ballroom dancing to me, like. If you just put mm. one hand, one hand over, you know, and your partner, he's just twirling bell around in that. Yeah, you get like a little mini Barbie doll kind of. Yeah. I bet Skipper is the right size for that. If they still, okay. make, that, they still make that. Okay, question for the chat. How many of you, raise your hand, although we won't be able to see you raise your hand, have put a mini in the mouth of one of these dragons at some point in one of your games? Oh, yeah. You could also just say I in the chat. Yeah, you you could. Yeah, that would probably make sense, wouldn't it? Which I should they say? I. Um, <laughs> depends on their sense of humor, I guess. I. I. How many of those dragons do you have, Eric? I don't have the Colossal Red Dragon. Is that the only one you're missing? Yep. I have all the others, though. With awesome. The detachable fire. Yeah, the one with the huge fire. I have played with it before. It just wasn't mine. <laughs> Bye, Emily. <laughs> I ran this series of games back in fourth edition where they were called the God Slayer games or God Slayer Encounters, I suppose, where I told each player to create a 30th level character. And then I would run them through one encounter with a godlike entity and just, just see how it went. The first one was Orcus. And Jeremy Crawford went Nova on Orcus and stomped him in like two rounds <laughs> with his paladin. Oh, nice. That was just straight Orcus from the Monster Manual in fourth edition. Okay. The second one was Demogorgon and Dagon at the same time. Party still won that fight in about four or five rounds. The third one was a Shardalon, except a super powerful Shard a Shardalon that I had made intentionally more powerful, right? It it's supposed to be like a CR 35, CR 40 fight on its own, but I upped it dramatically. And I set the fight on top of a volcano, an erupting volcano, and said a Shardalon had lava walk. No, oh, nice. Right. Because, I mean, it wouldn't be affected by the heat because it's red dragon. And in addition to a Shardalon, there were six... Baylor sword mages. So they were Baylors, but I had given them sword mage abilities. I think they were ensnaring sword mages or assault sword mages, but generally they were there to frustrate the player's attempts to hit a Shardalon or anything that they intended to hit. Hmm. Six of I them. I don't remember sword mages. So, like, what made them? Was their special mechanic? Sword Mage uh, was kind of like a blade singer, I guess, but they're spe they were a defender. So their thing was you would mark an enemy. Okay. Does everybody remember the marking mechanic from fourth edition? Mm -hmm. uh, the defender type 
So fighters, paladins, sword mages, wardens, a certain type of psychic warrior, I don't remember exactly which, um, they would mark an enemy, like, and then if that enemy attacked anyone other than the person who had marked them, they would have a penalty to uh, to hit them. So basically the, the base concept of the marking mechanic is the enemy is going to come hit me instead of the rest of the party because it's going to be easier to hit me than the rest of the party, which generally is not true because the defender also tends to have very high AC, right? But many of the classes would then have something else that would happen in addition to just the basic marking thing. Like sword mages, for instance, there were three kinds of sword mages, assault, ensnaring, and shielding. Assault sword mages, when they would mark an enemy and then that enemy would attack someone other than the sword mage, they could teleport next to the enemy and attack them. As a reaction? Yes. Nice. So it was essentially like an attack of opportunity from wherever. Okay. Um, an ensnaring sword mage is when when um, the marked target would attack someone other than them, they would teleport the target next to them. So like runs over to attack Caliph and the sword mage goes, ah, 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 come over here. I like that one. Um, and then the shielding sword mage was whenever they would attack someone other than the sword mage, the sword mage could use a reaction to reduce the damage of the attack. Hmm. So I, uh, my longest running fourth edition character was a shielding sword mage. And I got to the point where I would reduce damage from attacks by like 25 or 30 points. And the DM would just look at me like, why? And I'm like, because you're not attacking me. That's my job. I'm doing my job, man. And he's like, ah. and it was great. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, you know, Robis says uh, an attempt to allow tanking as a valid tactic. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, um, I like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it is because I played, like, MMORPGs, and 4th Edition did have a lot of, like, MMORPG, especially, like, World of Warcraft-type mechanics into it. Like, the yeah, meta game it was, of it, right? It healers, was supposed damage to be, healers, tanks. Yeah, it was supposed to be comfortable for people who had come to gaming through those kind of systems right yeah i mean I like... let's let's not pretend that you know it, it wasn't partly influenced by that um that aspect of the industry yeah totally um, also just i feel like they it's it's a known thing that they were aiming to make something that was a lot easier yeah. to explain to new people which fundamentally it really is i taught my parents how to play fourth edition i would not try <laughs> nice. to do that with any other edition <laughs> Oh, I can't imagine trying to teach my dad how to play 5th edition. Or D&D no. &D at all, but maybe that'll be a stream someday. Well, That's cute. I gave my mom a little, uh, I think she was a dwarf cleric named, she named, gave it a Valkyrie name, because my mom's very into the fact that she's Danish, part Danish, uh, uh, mm -hmm. named Regan Leaf. So Regan, she had a little mini, and she was very comfortable with, with saying this mini is going to do the thing. She did not want to pretend to be the dwarf cleric, but or paladin. I don't remember. It was cute mini. Thanks. Yeah, I um man, I think it's I don't know. My dad is not really a gamer at all, but he's one of those people where um, you know, he'll be really resistant to it. But then once you actually get him, he will fight you tooth and nail, he will like, you know, insult you and all that stuff. Once you get him there and doing the thing he will oftentimes like just instantly immerse in the thing and will like not want to stop doing it. So like it took me forever to convince him to play Mario Kart with me as a kid. Like he was like, why would you play this? Why don't you go practice your driving skills in real life? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And then like once we actually sit, get down and play, like four hours pass by, like I'm done after two hours. And he's like, one more level, just one more level. <laughs> He wasn't even good at it. I he would it. just like run into the, the walls over and over, hit himself with his own banana peels and, and turtle shells. <laughs> but there's just something about the experience. Really so, yeah, That's he's funny. so into it. 
I played that for the first time in an arcade, and just to, like, set the scene, my son loves Mario Kart, and I am terrible at driving games. Unless there's a steering wheel involved, it turns out. Because I Ooh. kill at the arcade Mario Kart. He was just like, what the hell is happening here? <laughs> nah. I was, like, drifting and stuff. I can't do that with the thumbsticks. I just turn way too hard. Yeah, it's about my practice. What's that? Real life practice. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know how to drive right. a car. I'm very good at driving a car, I think. Um, but I'm not good at driving a joystick. It's harder to drift on that arcade machine. I've played that arcade machine before. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. It's much easier for me, at least, on the, the 64 with the button. I'm just used to it. Yeah. Okay, so it's 626. We do have to still play the recap and then run yep. an ad. Is there anything anybody else has uh, wants to drop before we go? No, okay. I think, so. I think we're good. All right. Well, I guess we'll see you after a couple of minutes. Don't go away. Well, the regulars at Candlekeep certainly have been busy. While Cecilia and Sar broke into the nearby bathhouse because they decided to take a bath way too late, uh, Caleb got approached by a strange man who claimed to be one of the readers uh, at Candlekeep. And, well, he apparently wanted more uh he wanted more stong music which i love stong to pieces and i love his music it's just i didn't expect him to have this many fans this far out Kaleth, who had managed to convince the man that she was cecilia which is odd but whatever managed to get him to agree to give them help finding some place called the black archive which according to a note pinned to the door of their room could at least potentially hold the answers they seek. He did agree in exchange for an original song written by the man himself. And after some successful bluffing, he made good on his promise. Well, more or less. He did furnish the Irregulars with a letter that could get them into the inner portion of Candlekeep, beyond the Emerald Door, which it's a green door. I, I don't know what to tell you. Getting into the Black Archive, however, wasn't going to be easy and they did manage to persuade, uh, with some clever talking, a uh, scholar in the inner section of, of Candlekeep to direct them to where to go, or at least in the right direction, which then led them to a series of underground tunnels where they met a really creepy woman. Not directly. They didn't meet her directly. Which is all well and good, since she seems to be capable of turning people to stone. Now, they bluffed around her by pretending to be her friend, which turns out to be the rumored undead dragon that lurks in the tunnels beneath Candlekeep. And unfortunately, we did leave off with them coming face to face with said undead ghost dragon. So, I hope it goes well. Maybe the talking will work again. 